right, so for calculus today, I'm just going to go over some questions that I got from you guys. That's all I'm going to do today. Um, we're going to have to do either an assignment or a test on chapter four. I'm sort of leaning towards the assignment end of things, maybe. Um, also, we need to do just a unit thing of some type because we are coming to the end of the quarter. Um, who knew that this is how we were going to have to be doing it? Uh, but it doesn't sound like we're going to be coming back together anytime soon based on the news and everything. So I guess we're just going to have to figure out how this is going to work going forward. Um, so we're going to do a review, an assignment, a something on chapters one through four. We're going to have to do that. Um, so I'll be uploading that in the next couple of days as well, and I'll put the due date on it when I get that. Um, I've got to really sit down and do some lesson planning. I needed the weekend for a break. I don't know about you guys, but last week was kind of stressful, so I kind of needed to just take a break. I hope you guys did the same thing. Um, I'm trying not to overwhelm you with a ton of work, but at the same time, we have to get through stuff, so I'm trying to balance those two things. Um, so I am going to be uploading an assignment and all I'm going to do today is review homework. Tomorrow I will review chapter four in its entirety. All right. Um, and I'll kind of have more of a direction for you at that point in terms of what's happening. Um, cause I'm in a lesson plan tomorrow. That's my goal. So, but I, I wanted to do a two or three of you. Um, reached out and said you were having some problems both on page 242 and page 249. So if you did not have any problems in those sections, then you can stop watching me at this point. Um, I'm going to start on page 242 because that's numerical order. And um, three, it looks like E and I and one A and C. Those are the questions that I got from some people out there. Um, so, page 242, 1A says, find the velocity function for the given acceleration and the initial velocity. So, it says that the acceleration is just 5 and the initial velocity is 10. Now, the only reason that they give you the initial velocity is so that when you figure out the velocity formula, you can figure out if there's a constant there, what should that constant be? So again, we're doing antiderivatives in this section. If we're going from acceleration to velocity, that means we are headed backwards. So right now, this is like t to the zero. So I'm going to increase my exponent by one. So it's t to the first. And I'm gonna divide this by one, which is gonna give me five t. But it could be that there's also a constant there. And I don't know what that constant is. That's why they gave me this information so that I could figure it out. Because now that I know what my velocity formula is, if my time is zero, my velocity is 10. So if my time is zero, my velocity is 10, which means my constant is 10. So when I go to give them the velocity, it's 5t. But now I know what to put in for that constant. I need to put 10 in there. So that 5t plus 10 is the formula for velocity. Um, C would be very, very similar. Um, they actually give me that my acceleration this time is 5t. Um, and they say my initial, whoa, almost dropped the board on the ground. It says the initial velocity is three. So um, again, this would be 5t to the first. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to increase my exponent by one. So that would make, uh, sorry, t squared. I'll just leave that five there for a second. I'm gonna need it. Um, but once I figure out that it's t squared, that means I have to divide this by two. So I'm gonna have five over two t squared 
um, and there's nothing else there. So that means perhaps there is a constant of some kind. I don't know what that constant would be, but just like before, they say when my time is zero, my velocity is three. So when my time is zero, my velocity is three, which means my constant is three. So my velocity formula is five over two t squared plus three. So that's number one, um, A and C. And number three, E and I, they just want a general antiderivative. So they don't give you enough information to figure out what the constant is. So if I was just figuring out the general antiderivative, I would just leave that as a C. One of the things that people forget to do when they're doing an antiderivative is to put that C there, but it is really important because you don't know if there's a constant there or not. So in number three, E, they have C to the X, C of X is one over X squared, and they just wanna know the general antiderivative. So the first thing I would do is I would think of this as one X to the negative two. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to increase my exponent by one, which is gonna make it X to the negative one. And then I divide my coefficient by whatever my new exponent is. So one divided by negative one is negative one. Plus, there might be some constant that I don't know about. This is the general antiderivative. Now, I can leave it that way, um, but a lot of professors won't be happy with you if you do. Um, what you really should do, because that x has a negative exponent, is just move it down so that it's negative one over x plus c. That's what I would do with that. Um, I, same, very similar approach for i. For i, they give you, and I'm just, they say f at x, I'm just gonna leave it as c at x, um, one over x to the fifth plus one over x to the fourth. So again, the first thing that I would do before I start the antiderivative is I would make it um, so that it's not a fraction anymore. I would bring that x up and make the exponent negative. So again, same process as what I was doing before. I'm gonna add one to my exponent, which is gonna make it x to the negative fourth. But that means I have to divide this by negative four. So I have negative one fourth, x to the negative four. I have to add one to this exponent, which is going to give me x to the negative three. But that means I have to divide this by negative three. So I have negative one third, I don't care whether the negative is on the top or the bottom, it doesn't matter, um, x to the negative three, and then plus there might be some constant of some type that I am unaware of. And I have no way of figuring out what it is, so I just leave it as a C. So just to clean this up a little bit, and again, technically, you're done here, but it's not presented in the best way. So how any professor I ever had would want this is the fact that the um, exponent is negative means it goes on the bottom with the four. And I've got a plus and a minus here, so I'm gonna just make that a minus. One over three x cubed. Again, because the exponent is negative, I put it on the bottom, plus c. So that really is what the complete antiderivative would be presented in the best way possible. Um, would I accept it here? Because I know that's going to be your question. I might take off like 0.5 because technically it's not finished. Um, but out of like four points, you'd lose like 0.5 and that would be it. So it's up to you. Um, just because I know professors are picky and they're gonna want this. And more and more as they do things online, um, how you put it in really matters because when I was doing this with Melissa Atia for her course, if we put it in this way, it would tell her she was wrong. But if we put it in this way, it would tell her she was right. And 
a computer only has the ability to either say you're wrong or you're right. It doesn't have the ability to go, yeah, you just didn't go far enough. So that's why um, it's kind of in this day and age even more important that you know how to do the whole thing. All right, finally, um, oh, apparently I really need to tack down the bottom of the whiteboard. Finally, um, the rates of change for the social sciences. I just had a few questions there. Number one, C and D. Um, so it says that the cost is 2,500x minus 1.05x squared. Um, so first it says find the marginal cost, which just means find the derivative. So that's 2,500 minus, now I'd have to do 2 times 1.05. 2 times 1.05 is 2.1. You'd think I'd know that, but I don't. Um, so that's 2.1x. So that's the um, marginal cost. Now it says explain what it represents. It represents the rate of change of your cost. So it says find the marginal cost. So that means I'm going to be using my um, derivative. Find the marginal cost at a production level of 300 and explain what it means. So 2500 minus 2.1 times 300 will give us the marginal cost. So if I do 2.1 times 300 and I do 2,500 minus, um, whoops, minus, oh, that's bad, hold on. Uh, minus 2.1 times 300, here we go. I get 1870, and it says explain what this means. So what this means, it says a company estimates that the cost in manufacturing garden sheds so what this means is that because it's a positive, it means that at a production level of 300 sheds, they are increasing their costs by $1,870 for each shed that they build, which is a lot. Their costs are going up really, really quickly. Not a good thing. Um, and then it says, Find the cost of producing the 301st unit. So it says find the cost. So I would find the cost of making 301 sheds and subtract the cost of making 300 sheds. And that would actually give me the cost of manufacturing just that 301st shed. So I would do 2,500 times 301 minus 1.05 times 301 squared. And then I would subtract, and I'm gonna subtract everything from here on using 300, 2,500 times 300 minus 1.05 times 300 squared. It's gonna be close to that 1,870 um, number. I'm not gonna figure it out. You can do that with your calculator. Um, I'm gonna let you figure that out, but what you're actually figuring out is what did it cost you to make shed number 301? Um, and it's gonna be very close to your rate of change. And that's when they say Compare and comment on the results from part C and D. It looks like this dude's costs are pretty high for making a shed. He's going to have to sell them for a pretty hefty cost in order to make any profit. Um, it looks like his costs are getting out of control, so he may need to look at um, finding a better supplier for his materials, finding people who work cheaper, something. But he needs to figure out how to reduce those costs because they seem pretty high. That's what I would say. Um, 2C, I love this because it kind of, 2C is the same thing. Find the cost of producing 5,500 and first TV. 
So again, I would take the cost of the 5,500 and first TV and minus the cost of the 5,500th TV, and that would tell me. So exactly the same as this. So 2C, exactly the same as this. You're going to use your cost formula for question two. You're going to put in 5,501 and subtract 5,500 to figure out what it costs you to make that 5,501st TV. Um, 4D. 4D, compare this to the actual increase when the 701st cup is sold. Don't worry about that. If you're getting your answer right, just don't worry too much about that. Um, it's okay. 6C, again, compare um, the rate of change in 1995 to the actual birth based on the model. Um, don't worry too much about that. I'm not going to be asking you questions like that on the test, so don't worry too much about that. Don't focus too much. I'm much more focused on can you do the math, okay? Um, and 9C. 9C. Find the marginal profit. Okay, this one has actual math in it. Let's do that one. 9C. Oh, come on. All right, so for number nine, it says the cost function is 5,000x minus 2.8x squared. And the price function, I guess I should have put a little x there. The price function is 80 minus 0.018x. That's the price function. Now, part C, which I believe, yep, that's the question. 9C wants us to find the marginal profit function. So this involves more work than I want it to. Profit. Is revenue, money coming in, minus costs, money going out. So the money coming in, subtract the money going out. Now I already have a cost formula here, that's great. Um, I don't have a revenue formula. I have a price formula. But a revenue formula is really just the number that I sell, which is X, times the price that I sell it at, which is 80 minus 0.018X. So if I expand that out, that is 80x minus 0.018x squared. So that's my revenue formula. So profit is my revenue, which I just figured out with 80x minus 0.018x squared, minus my cost, which is 5,000x minus 2.8x squared. So I have 80x minus 5,000x, so 80 minus 5,000, well you would think I would know that, 80 minus 5,000, that is negative 4,920x, and negative 0.018x squared minus negative 2.8x squared. So remember you have a negative and a negative which makes a plus, just watch your signs there, negative 0.018 plus 2.8 gives me plus 2.782x squared. So that is my profit formula, but it asked me for the marginal profit formula. So that just means I'm going to take the derivative. I hope you can see the bottom of the board. I tried to angle it so you could. Um, so the derivative here would be negative 4,920. I'm going to bring my 2 down and multiply it with the number that's there. So plus 5.564x. That would be my marginal profit function. All right? So that's the answers to those questions. Again, I'm going to upload some stuff um, on Tuesday. I'm going to do a quick emphasis on the quick. This took longer than I hoped. 
Um, I'm going to do a quick review of chapter four so that we can do something, be it a test, be an assignment, we can do something to evaluate chapter four. All right. Talk to you again soon. Bye.